we'd be roller skating or something. We said, oh, we're bored. Let's go climb the sign. And we'd go up the hill and the back part of the letters, there was a lot of wooden scaffolding and it was all splintery. Right. We got splinters and all this. No wonder we didn't break our necks. Yeah, fall and off. I'd climb up and the O's <laughs> were my favorite. And I'd lean over the O's and I'd say, Hollywood! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're great in the show. I loved it. Oh, great. Uh, it looked like a, a, a good time making it as well. When they, I got the call from the director and um, producer about being in this project, I, all I had to do was hear who was in it. Kristen Wiig, Laura Dern, Allison Janney, Ricky Martin, on and on and on. And I said, I'm in. I don't care what you want me to do. I didn't even read the script. And then finally, when I got the script, well, that was the icing on the cake. So, because it's a great, great script. And, but then to work with all of these people. So I have a whole bunch of new friends. Yeah. I even Wordle now with um, Allison. Do you know what Wordle is? What's your, what's your opening word? Oh, I, I change it all the time. My, my mom's was a Jew for a while. Oh, yeah. Like, and yeah. audio is always good. Yeah, I get all those vowels in there. I have the distinct honor saying within the past three months, I've gotten it in one six times. No way. How do you do that? I, it was just total crazy. Do you into it? I, yeah, it was just that my husband and I were doing it. And this one morning we were talking about the fact that my mother years ago had a parakeet. And my, she, from, she bought it for my little kid sister. And my kid sister wanted her to name it Tweety. Mm -hmm. And my mother said, oh, for heaven's sake, every parakeet and bird in the world is named Tweety. Come on, let's be original. Let's, let's call him Stash. When we were talking about that, so I said, let's put in Stash. And that was the word. No way. Uh -huh. You're like, you're like a crystal ball for the world. I mean, you got like we, a real yeah, divine script. But we did script. it six more times, five oh, more times. <laughs> I'm going to start getting the opening word from you. I'm going to start Yeah, right. Like, right. Yeah, I should... You know, what strikes me is that Alice and Janney and, 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 and Kristen Wiig and, and all these people, they've all, and not to, you know, not to put you on the hot seat here, but they've all talked about you as a great inspiration to them. Oh. Have they, did they get the opportunity to tell you any of that stuff? Yeah, they have. But you know what my response is to that? And I'm flattered. Believe me, I'm very flattered. But Tom, if I'd never been bored, they'd be doing what they're doing. It has nothing to do with me. I'm glad they had looked at, you know, was, I, I'm kind of embarrassed about it. But uh, no, they'd be doing what they're doing if I'd never been born. I get that you're a bit embarrassed. I you know what I'm saying. Know. I know, but still, it's nice. It's, it's lovely. Nice. They, these yeah. people grew up, especially, you know, women in comedy, I know. growing up watching the show. I used to say that to Lucille Ball. Say what? Thank you. You've inspired me. And she didn't quite say what I am saying now, but... Mm -hmm. She said, oh, come on, kid. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have any sort of like, you're welcome. Uh, no, she, well. she kind of poo-pooed it, you know. Getting to know your your uh, life as well as I have over the past, you know. Uh -oh. oh, yeah, I got a lot of hard questions for you about that. <laughs> but uh, the, the past week or so, you know, doing research for this, what really strikes me is that I'm kind of in your home. Like you grew up in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Like what, a block from? Hollywood Boulevard. But... A million miles away from Hollywood. What do you mean? Well, I was never thought I would do this. I was I never thought of being a performer at all. Yeah. I thought I would be a journalist. I was editor of my junior high school paper and Hollywood High School News. And I thought, well, I'll go to UCLA and major in journalism. Good good thing you didn't. Well what happened yeah. was I got to UCLA. And they didn't have a journalism major. You could take a course and join the school paper, but they didn't have a major. So I got the catalog out, and I'm looking through, and there's theater arts and, and different things, theater arts English, theater arts film, theater arts theater, so forth. And I thought, theater arts English, because I love to write, they offered playwriting courses. So I thought, okay, I'll... I'll major in theater arts English, join the Daily Bruin newspaper, and still pursue being a journalist. 
and but I didn't know at the time uh, that if you majored in theater arts, whether you wanted to write or produce or direct or write, you had to, as a freshman, take an acting yeah, course, yeah. a c scenery course, costume, and something else I can't remember. So I was terrified. So I got into this acting class, and I had to do a scene. And my Texas and Arkansas background helped me because I had a monologue to do that was a hillbilly woman. Do you remember any of it? Oh, well, I, all I remember is I said one part, I said, I'm back, something like that, I don't know what it was. <laughs> and the class laughed. And I, I thought, where they should, you know. Yeah. And I thought, I, this is kind of a good feeling. And, I, and so then a couple of the kids were doing some one acts, they called them, at, uh, at UCLA and asked me to be in some, so I got in some of the others. And I started doing comedy. Yeah. But I was always a nerd in school. I yeah. was very quiet. But this, I don't know, it just came out. But weren't you a performer too? Like the stories I heard was that like you and your grandmother would go to these- Movies. Eight a week, but I was- At I was, times. Yeah. And you would come home and act- By myself. Some of the scenes out. Yeah, Is that by right? myself, but never, no, I would just pretend to be Betty Grable at one point. It was a great movie star. Yeah. And, but I never thought of doing it for real in front of anybody. Right. What were you doing? Like, what, what movies were you acting in? Oh, I would do, there was one called The Dolly Sisters. Yeah. That was uh, Betty Grable. And um, I don't know, we'd make up stories with the kids in the, in the, in the block. We'd play Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. <laughs> and Nyoka, which was another queen of the jungle. Yeah. And we would uh and then we'd fly kites right. and roller skate and climb the Hollywood sign. Oh wow. We we'd be roller skating or something, we'd say, Oh, we're bored, let's go climb the sign. And we'd go up the hill and the back part of the letters there's a lot of wooden scaffolding and it was all splintery. Right. We got splinters and all. It's a wonder we didn't break our necks. Yeah. And, but I climb up and the O's were my favorite. <laughs> and I'd lean over the O's and I'd say, Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. But that, that was my fantasy. But as far as being any kind of a actress or yeah. performer or singer, yeah. never occurred to me until accidentally there was a, a journalism major. If there had been, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now about what I'm doing. There's a lot of weird, um, like interesting fortune throughout that story too. Like the stories that I was reading about, like it feels like there's so many, like you're right, if you didn't take a journalism class and you didn't act, uh, you, you wouldn't have ended up talking to me, you wouldn't end up in this in this show, you wouldn't have ended up in the, you know, inspiring all these people. But also there's a lot of stuff that's not as linear than that. Like when I heard the story about the person giving you like your tuition randomly in the mailbox. No, what happened was I wanted to go to UCLA. Yeah. But um, my grandmother said we can't afford it. How much was it? What do you think uh, tuition was in 1951 to go to UCLA? Like $500, $500, $400? 43 dollars 43 bucks it was it and we didn't have that money a lot of money back then well our rent was 30 dollars a month a dollar a day yeah and we could kind of hardly make that so she said we can afford 43 dollars that's crazy well we lived in this one room at uh, at this apartment building with a murphy pull down bed i slept on the couch and every morning I would look out across the lobby and there was these pigeonhole mailboxes and to see if there was a letter in our slot. And this one morning there was, and I went and I brought it back in. The envelope had my name typewritten on it and uh, address. And I opened it up and there was a $50 bill. And to this day, Tom, I don't know where that came from. You never got any clues or anything like that? Everybody in the neighborhood was poor. Yeah. And if anybody I knew it just said, look, I'm going to give you, 50, you know, they would 
It was totally anonymous, but that was my ticket to UCLA. But that's, but that's one. And then the, in UCLA, right. that, that businessman yeah. comes yeah. over and he offers you what? He well, I then after I got started to perform at UCLA, I got into the music department. Yeah. And I started to sing. I had sung with my grandmother and mother in the kitchen, mama playing the ukulele. Yeah. We'd sing and harmonize. But I never belted, you know, or anything like that. But somehow I started to do that. And I wound up doing, working in what they called a musical comedy workshop. So we were gonna do the finals and our, our professor was going to grade us. There were nine of us in the class. And he said, you know, my wife and I are going to be at a party in San Diego next weekend. And uh, it's formal. And why don't you kids come down and do your scenes as entertainment for the party? Yeah. And I'll grade you. Yeah. Instead of having to do it, you know, in, in an auditorium. Whoa, party, Sandy, wow. <laughs> so we all went down, different cars, <laughs> and uh, it was lovely. It was a you know very formal black tie affair, and we were the entertainment. I did a scene from Annie Get Your Gun, which was a very popular musical comedy on Broadway at yeah, the time. Yeah. And, and then I was going to the hors d'oeuvre table, and I'm stealing hors d'oeuvres in a napkin to take home to my grandmother yeah, yeah. to put in my purse. Yeah. And there's a tap on my shoulder. I thought, oh my God, I'm busted. <laughs> You're going to get kicked out. <laughs> and it was this gentleman and his wife. And he said, um, I really enjoyed what you did. I said, thank you very much. He said, so what do you want to do with your life? I said, well, someday I'd love to go to Broadway, be on musical comedy like Ethel Merman and Mary Martin, who were the big stars at the time. And he said, why aren't you there now? I said, well, I hope someday I can go, but I, I, I'm trying to save up, hope to have the money to go. He said, I'll lend you the money. And I thought maybe the champagne was talking. Yeah. And his wife said, no, he, 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 worked, well, he gave me his card. And he said, be at my office a uh, week from Monday, 9 o'clock, and we'll talk about your career. Well, I didn't tell my grandmother. I got down there, and um, he had this big, wonderful office in San Diego. Major businessman went in, big, beautiful mahogany desk and everything, you know, I was very intimidated. Yeah. And he said, I really enjoyed what you did to my wife and I. You want to go to New York? I'm going to lend you $1,000. Which was an ungodly. It's like 100000 yeah. today. And lend you, by the way. Yeah, well, and he said, I'm lending it to you. He said, hoping that if you do make it, uh, you pay me back, no interest. And other stipulations are, you must never reveal my name. You must use the money to go to New York on. Yeah. And if you're successful, you must help others out. I thanked him and I uh, went home and I showed my grandmother all this money. I thought she was going to have a heart attack. And she said, you know what we can do with a $1,000? And I said, Nanny, I have to go to New York. That's what this is for. That's what he said. I have to go to New York. And she said, <laughs> she said, <laughs> She said, you'll be dead in a week. Your blood's too thin. <laughs> <laughs> so encouraging. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but, oh, you can't go to New York. I said, I have to. So that's how I got to New York. But what do you make of that? Like, what do you make of it? Like, I don't know if you're a spiritual person. I don't know if you're like a, a believer in faith. You'd have to be something going on. It was like there's an angel on my shoulder. I don't know. For but... two anonymous... Well, to me, anonymous. And one, definitely anonymous. Yeah. People to just believe in you uh -huh. and give you yeah. a lot of, you know. Well, I got to New York. Now, I, this is how stupid I was. I was so naive. Yeah. Because of all the movies I used to go to, it was like Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland would say, we're going to put on a show in the barn and it's going to go to Broadway. And, of course, that's what happened in the movie. 
So I think I'm going to be in New York. I'll be there and then I'll be on Broadway. Easy. <laughs> Easy peasy. <laughs> so anyway, I'm on the plane. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where I'm going to stay. Mm -hmm. That's how naive I was. I was 21 years old. And I'm reading the New Yorker magazine and mm -hmm. there's a ad for the Algonquin Hotel, which is where the round table was with Dorothy Parker and, and uh, Robert Benchley, all these brains who used to hold court there. I thought, well, I'll go to the Algonquin first. So I had a little bit of money left after the plane ride and all of that. And I checked in and it was $9 a day. I mean, our rent was $1 a day. Right. So I thought, oh my God, okay. Anyway, but I had to stay somewhere. So I checked in and I called home and talked to my grandmother, Collect, yeah. and my mother, and they said, come home, I just got there. I just got there. I said, I'm here, I, where are you gonna stay? Well, I'll, I'll be okay. And I hung up and I started to cry. What am I going to do? And I've always loved rain. Not when it floods, of course, yeah. but nice rain. Yeah. You know, you know. And it started to rain. Mm -hmm. And I turned on the radio in the hotel room. And it said, I swear to God, Hurricane Carol is landing in New York. <laughs> yeah, she has. Yeah, yeah. That. Yeah. Look it up, August 1954. Yeah. And I thought, whoa. Something spooky about that. Carol. I told, tell me, you're talking about spooky. Yeah, then I had one phone number yeah. in my wallet of a girl who had gone to UCLA ahead of me. And she was in New York. She said, if you, if you ever get to New York, give me a call. So I called her the next day and she said, where are you? I said, I'm at the Algonquin Hotel. She said, get away, from, come, get, come to where I am. And she gave me the address, and I'm in my cardboard suitcase, and I'm rain, it's raining. I get up to, and it was a West 53rd Street between 5th and 6th, Brownstone, and it was a place called the Rehearsal Club. Yeah. And it was for young women who want to be in the theater, very on the up and up, had a house mother, strict rules, yeah. all of that. $18 a week room and board mm. because it was sponsored by some very wealthy ladies in New York right? who, who subsidized it. They had one vacancy. It was a cot in what they call the transit room on the first floor. Yeah. And I, so she showed me into the room. There were four other girls in the room, five of us now, one room, one closet, one bathroom. I had a cot and a dresser and a couple of blankets, Nothing. a pillow. I was thrilled. I had never slept in a bed. You'd I'd never always slept, slept on, on a, a, a couch. Always slept on a couch. Next to a Murphy bed. So for you, that was luxurious. I, I, wow. Yeah. <laughs> she said, I'm sorry, it's just, just a cot. I said, it, it was beautiful to me. That's beautiful, Carol. <laughs> I thought it was great. How, how do you deal with the. Um, because you, it, it, when you get off the plane, you think, okay, I'm going to be a Broadway star right away. You weren't a Broadway star right away. You faced, that rehearsal club, those stories is unbelievable to think about that. Everyone is living, going to these big cattle call auditions. And then you, but as, as is the life of any performer, most of it, especially in your early days, is getting turned down. How did you... What did, how did you deal with like rejection? How did you deal with that part of it? Because I can only imagine you got all this money, people believing in you, your your grandmother saying like, this better work out or you got to come home yeah. and people are saying no to you. How did you handle that? A lot of us were being turned down and then some would get a job. It just depended on luck, you know? And so um, at this one point, I, I remember I auditioned for something and it looked like I was going to get it. It wasn't a big deal with another girl that was between me and this other girl. Yeah. And I thought I had it, but I didn't. She got it. And it's really weird, Tom. Instead of being discouraged, I thought, well, you know what? It's her turn. Yeah. It's not my turn. My turn will come. 
So that helped me from being just discouraged. Yeah. So I was never that. And then finally I got in to see, the problem was if you got saw an agent, they said, let me know when you're in something. I said, how do I get in something? You have to have an agent. Yeah, right. So it's catch 22. So this one time I got in to see an agent, I showed him my scrapbook with good reviews from UCLA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like it's going to be a big deal. <laughs> Here's my report card. And he said, okay, let me know when you're in something. And I said, oh. I said, how do I do this? He said, oh, go put on your own show. Bingo. I went back to the rehearsal club, called a meeting with the girls, and I said, we're going to put on a show. And we wrote it, and each girl had a, a certain thing that she could do. One was in the Spanish dancing, and another was an opera singer, another this sort so what we did was we put it all together and we wrote on penny postcards to every producer, director, agent in town saying, you're always saying, let us know when you're in something. Well, the famous rehearsal club is putting on the rehearsal club review, March, whatever, mm -hmm. so forth. This penny postcard is your ticket. So come and see us. And the, the rich ladies who subsidized us gave us $200 to rent a Carl Fisher concert hall on mm. 57th Street. Mm -hmm. We did it for two nights and we were packed. They came, they saw, and three of us got ages. Yeah, beautiful, hey? But it's, make your own breaks. Yeah. You obviously had a bit of a hunger about you. You obviously had a bit of ambition about you. But oh, you know what I mean. You know, I like... I was never not optimistic. I I think it was the movies. Yeah. That I grew up with. It. It was. A, that was a time when none of the movies were cynical. Yeah. Everybody, the good guys made it. The bad guys got their just desserts. Yeah. It that nothing was impossible. Because that's why I I was so naive. But I think being that naive is what helped me. Of course. And optimistic. Of course it's going to work out. I yeah. mean, it has to. Yeah. Right? That's, yeah. That's the way it's written. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, no, just skip ahead, because there's a part of the story that I find really interesting. So you, you end up on The Gary Moore Show, which was this sort of like, very similar to The Carol Burnett Show, what I ended up becoming, you know, musical, sketch comedy, yeah. uh, uh, live to tape, I think, like live, you know. And um, you get this deal. I think I have it written down here. The, uh, get this deal where if you wanted to do a variety show, <laughs> you had five years to ask and CBS had to make it. But what I find interesting is not like the details of the deal itself, is that when you actually called them and said like, okay, I'm, I want to make good on that, it didn't go as smoothly as you thought it was well, going to go. Well, they had forgotten that, that that was a part of the contract that I had with them and they didn't remember. <clears throat> so... I said I wanted to do, it, it, it required me to do a one hour comedy variety show for 30 shows. They would yeah. have to put us on whether they wanted to or not. Yeah. So and the, the vice president of the call, he had forgotten about it because it's five years have gone by. And he said, well, let me get back to you. And I'm sure he got a bunch of lawyers out that evening and called me back the next day. And he said, yeah, Carol, you know, but... Comedy variety, it's a man's game. Right. It's not for you gals. Right. It's Sid Caesar, it's Milton Berle, it's Jackie Gleason. Now it's Dean Martin. And then he said, we've got a sitcom we want you to do called Here's Agnes. <laughs> Here's Agnes. <laughs> yeah, it writes itself. Oh, please. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to be Agnes every week. I want to have music. I want to have guest stars. I want to have a rep company. I yeah. want dancers. Yeah. I want an orchestra. Yeah. The whole thing. I yeah. And they had to put us on the air. But they only thought we were going to go for 30 shows. Yeah. We wound up doing 276. Yeah. But but don't you now? But doesn't that make sense that like when people like I mean we mentioned the 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 stars of Palm Royale earlier, but like 
like Julia Louis-Dreyfus, you know, I, I heard her talking to you not that long yeah. ago, that like they talk about you, especially for women in comedy and in, in women in show business, is this real icon, this real feminist icon. I mean, you have, uh, you mentioned it was Sid Caesar and, and Dean Martin and you really changed TV. So like, how do you feel when people say that kind of thing to you? I'm, I'm flattered, of yeah. course, you know, I'm, I'm flattered, but I, I don't think that I, I never thought when we were doing it that that would be a, called a trailblazer. That never occurred to me. It was what I knew how to do because I learned it on the Gary Moore show. Yeah. And I just transferred it on to my, my own show. But I wanted a rep company. Even though it said Carol Burnett, I, it was a true rep company. There were sketches where I would be supporting Tim. Tim would be supporting Vicky. Harvey would be supporting me. It was all a, a, a group. As I said, a real true rep company, yeah. and to have variety and music and guests, and you know, I was in heaven because it was more fun actually than doing Broadway. I know about the the tugging at your it was your left ear, right? My grandmother. Yeah, to say hi to your grandmother. It said originally it was hi nanny, I'm fine, yeah. I love you. Yeah. And after I got successful, it was hi nanny, I'm fine, I love you. Your checks on the way. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the question I have is that she, correct me if I'm wrong, she passed before the Carol Burnett show. Yeah, but she did get to see me on Broadway. Yeah, and she did get to see me doing uh, Gary's show. So was there some <laughs> meaning that you kept? You mean you still do it? Yeah, is I just still do it. Why? I don't know. It just became a thing. I think I transferred it when Nanny passed away. I transferred it to my kids. Yeah. You know, it's just something. You know. I think there's something really beautiful about it, that yeah. even though she's passed on, to me, I was like, oh, I wonder if she's still, you know, if well, she's still kind of passing it, that on. You know? Well, it's to her and to my kids. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I, um, I, I was sort of thinking a little bit about I mean, I sort of came in going like, hey, so, you know, you've been on this whole roller coaster and you've been this really groundbreaking artist and you've done so much for so long. And I had all this sort of like looking back <laughs> ending, you know, like, oh, how do you feel when you sing the song now? And how do you when you look back in your career, how do you feel and all that? But what strikes me from watching this show and from talking to you and getting to know you a little bit is you're not really stopping. You're not really you, you, you haven't really slowed down. You're still no. You're it's still really working. funny. This is I'm 90 years old now. Are so you? it was just. Like two years ago, I, I I did Better Call Saul. Yeah. And I adored doing it. It was such fun. It was like a family. And I thought, well, that's why. So I'll do anything that comes along that it looks like it's going to be fun. Anything else? I'm fine staying at home. You know, and then this came. And it was like, wow, slam dunk. You know, here, I, Better Call Saul, which I adored. And now here's another one with another family. And it was a family. And fun to work. That That's my point. If I'm healthy enough and it looks like a good project and if it's going to be fun, I want to have fun. I don't want any angst. I want to be with people that feel the way I do about life and about performing. And I have, I've lucked out now two times in a row. Better Call Saul, and now Palm Royale. I got to tell you, you know, um, getting to uh, 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 talk to you, getting to look into your life, um, getting to spend some time with your work, in, very, in a very cynical time, um, has given me such a, a, a great joy and that sense of fun that you're talking about. It. So I really appreciate it, Carol. Thank Thanks so much you. for making the time. Thank you. When do you go back? Uh, not soon enough. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>